Cross-country bikes are well known for being extremely light and fast across the ground, but not exactly confidence inspiring when you point them down or through technical terrain. So today we're gonna to look at a number of things you might wanna to do to your cross-country bike to get a bit more performance and confidence from it. This is my Canyon Lux cross country bike. It's super light, super fast, and as stock, really, well, it would make an incredible race bike for anyone. I don't race though, and there's a few things I've changed on this to give me a bit more confidence for the way I like to ride and the places I like to ride. And there's definitely a few takeaway things that could help you out. So to the cockpit first, and you've probably noticed I've got a pretty wide, well, a very wide set of handlebars on here. Now, Cross-country bikes tend to come with handlebars up to about 740 mil, like this one with a built-in 80 mil stem, because they offer the best compromise of control versus lightweight versus riding position. There's a lot of things at stake, bearing in mind that you've got to be a super efficient up, along, and down on a cross-country bike. It's all about maintaining speed the whole time. However, I'm on the tool side, so this doesn't always play very well with me. So I've actually taken a weight hit here by putting an alloy bar on, that is 800 millimeters wide. Now this might seem excessive to you, but I'm about 194 centimeters or nearly 6'4", 6 6'3 6 and a half, something like that. And they really, like the riding stance it puts me in is much more aggressive and it's much more comfortable. Okay, so I'm not a cross country racer, so I'm not looking as such to really cut off the weight like you would with something like this. What I'm looking for is that riding position. It really does make a difference. It lowers me on the bike as well. It opens up my chest. It makes everything that little bit easier for me. The one downside with a super, or two downsides with a super wide bar. Now, the first one is your clearance when you're going through the trees. Now, I feel pretty well adjusted to it. You know, I do, I do have, you know, the cat whiskers thing going on with my elbows. I kind of know when I'm in the region of about to hit my hands, but it's not for everyone. Some people want to go that bit narrower. And the other thing, of course, is by having a wide bar on, you expose flex in other areas of the bike. If your frame is exceptionally lightweight, you can feel flex in the front end of the frame. You can feel flex in the fork, in the wheel, and in the stem from a wide handlebar. So you do need to take that into account. Now I swapped the stem out because I wanted to maintain the, the rough riding position on this bike for something like for like. So it's an 80 mil and it's a minus six, exactly the same as what, what it came with. So I didn't want to disrupt that. I just wanted that wider stance on the front end and it feels brilliant for me. Now, while we're here, something important to talk about is the stem length. Now you see on a lot of trail bikes, people running shorter and shorter stem lengths. Yeah, that's great, but the bike has to grow proportionally to allow for that. If you were to just put a shorter stem on a cross country bike and hope your handling will improve, actually you'll probably find it will be worse. The cross country bike has been designed around a stem length. This is an XL, it comes with the 80 mil stem. Other bike sizes will come with shorter or longer stems accordingly. Okay, so think about it on the triangle sort of basis, right? So your wheel axles and where your head is should really form, in an ideal world, like an equilateral triangle between the three, yeah? If you've got a short stem, your, your effective position is gonna come up slightly. So your hands are gonna be closer to where your feet are. Yes, yeah, so you're gonna be more upright. That means less stability when you're stood up. And it also means for extreme climbing and extreme descending, you're gonna be moving your, your weight much more further forwards and rearwards the entire time to maintain a good balance. Yeah, if you're in a good stance on the bike where your bars are wide enough, your whole position is balanced front and rear, you're gonna feel so much more confident the whole time. Now there's two more things you can do to the cockpit of your bike to give you a bit more confidence. One of them is your handlebar grips. You can get different diameter bar grips. Let's just say thinner side and the bigger side. Okay, so you might be thinking a bigger grip is more comfortable and that's gonna give you more confidence, right? Well, not necessarily, because if your hand's struggling to get good purchase on there, that itself leads you to death gripping. Death gripping on the bars gives you more fatigue and it'll make you feel panicked when you're riding rougher, more technical terrain, typically when you're descending. So a thinner grip, even though it has less cushioning, actually means you can hold on much lighter on the bar, avoiding that death grip and you just get more control. It's about being loose and relaxed and fluid on the bike. As soon as you're like, you're tight and you're tense and stuff, you're gonna be all over the place and it's gonna feel awful. Now, even though I've got quite big hands, I prefer a thinner handlebar grip for that exact reason. I like my hand to just be relaxed when it's on there. The more relaxed your hand is, the more control you have. So if your grips are a little bit big, try some thinner ones. Definitely makes a difference for control. 
Brake lever angle makes a big difference as well. Now, the typical advice you'll get with setting up your brake lever angle will be to get on your bike with the saddle at the correct or optimum riding height and run your brake levers roughly in line with your forearms and then make adjustments up or down from there to get your preference. Now, it's widely accepted that downhill riders will have a slightly higher position and cross-country riders will have a slightly lower one. Now, the theory behind running your, your controls quite low is when you're out of the saddle, you're really hammering. Everything is in line with your arm. It feels really good. It's a really strong stance. The problem with that is when you're riding technical terrain, you're actually putting your wrist at a bit more of an unnatural angle to reach those brake levers and controls. That's a weak position and it's not good. It puts more strain on your hand. By bringing your brake levers up, you get much more control. And yes, it might feel a little bit weird when you're out the saddle with your brake levers feeling quite high, but you do dial into it. When you're reaching for those brake levers, you put so much weight and stress through your thumb because of the fact that you're trying to stop yourself rolling forwards on the bars. When your brake levers are much higher up, you actually put your weight on the palm of your hand much more. Your thumb doesn't have to sort of grip the bar as such. So everything relaxes and it becomes a lot easier for control. Try running your brake levers a bit higher. You'll be surprised how much more confident it feels when you're riding descents. Okay, next up, we're gonna talk about pedals. Now, cross-country bikes tend to have clipless or clip-in style pedals. And like these ones, they all tend to be fairly small. Now, the reason for that is most cross-country shoes are very stiff, so that does a bit with supporting your weight. So therefore, the pedal can be much smaller. Now, the pedals tend to be quite close together. Now, the reason for this is ultimately, the narrower your Q factor or the closer your pedals are together, the more efficient it is for pedaling. The further they're apart, the less efficient for pedaling, but the more stable you feel. Now, just think about this for a minute. If you're to stand with your feet wide apart and someone pushes you from the side, you're nice and stable, yeah? If you put your feet close together and someone does the same thing, you're gonna put your foot out for stability, yeah? You're not stable when your feet are close together. Okay, so a narrow Q factor, or in case you wonder about Q factor, it stands for quack factor. Okay, so it's referring to the gait or the stance on a duck, which are always wide apart, yeah? So a narrow Q factor is necessary on cross-country bikes and road bikes for ultimate pedaling efficiency. You can move it slightly to give yourself a lot more stability. It makes a massive difference. So on the pedals I've got here, I've actually got longer axles on them. This is the axle that came with it, and if you look at them close up, you'll see my axles are actually quite a bit wider. Now, if you didn't want to change your axles, you can make a change basically by moving your cleat inboard, which in turn moves your foot slightly further out on the pedal. I promise you, it makes a massive difference. You've only got to look at the position of a World Cup cross-country rider versus a World Cup downhill racer just to see the difference. Yeah, the cross-country rider's going to be like this, moving knees out side to side to keep balance. Great technique, but it's not going to improve anything. Downhill rider, powerful stance. It's designed to be, well, stable, basically. So anything you can do to move your feet apart is going to help you with that. Now, of course, if you're the sort of rider that values all out pedaling efficiency on a the bike, then you won't want to go too far. But I'm running the same Q factor on this as I am on my trail bike, and I've never had any issues with my pedaling, and I've got loads of stability from doing this. Okay, so you've got your cross country bike, you've got your super light pedals and your fishing shoes. No doubt that's what you're supposed to be using. But the lack of feel that you get with shoes like this can actually lead to your bike feeling a bit nervous at times. So perhaps you might want to consider something a bit more flexible, right? So a trail shoe like this, this is an enduro focused shoe. Yes, okay, it's heavier, it's bigger. It might look a bit clumpy on your cross country bike, but I promise you, you'll get loads more feel back. If you've got different style riding shoes, definitely have a little experiment. You'll be amazed at the difference. I mean, the first thing you'll notice is the lack of efficiency difference between them. But if you're looking for more control or you wanna have a bit more fun on your bike, why not consider a slightly more flexible shoe and a pedal to match? It really can make a big difference. Drop a post. Come on, don't be such a purist that you don't think you need one. Drop a post makes descending much easier. You lower the, the center of gravity on the bike and you get more clearance. Why would you not run one? Okay, they are a bit heavier and mistly. Now this bike came with a 60 mil drop post, which some cross country racers are finding enough. And that's actually what I ran on my previous bike. But I fancy something a little bit longer and have actually fluked out on this one. So this one has 160 mil drop, but what it also means is it's completely slammed in the bike, so it actually looks neater as well. It looks really good. Now, if you're on the taller side or the shorter side, you're gonna get the biggest 
benefits from running a dropper post. Most smaller racers now are tending to run 29 inch wheels on their bikes and giving yourself the extra clearance makes a massive difference when you're descending. And taller riders like myself, well, we've got a higher center of gravity. The lower you can get yourself on the bike, it's not just about the clearance. The lower you can get yourself when you're descending, the more confidence you have. It's that simple. Dropper posts make a massive difference to your riding. Promise you, try one, you won't regret it. If your cross-country bike has rear suspension, get it set up correctly and use it, okay? We see far too many people struggling on cross-country bikes running not enough sag. I guess thinking perhaps that they're gonna make the bike handle a bit more efficiently for pedaling. If that's the case, it's not gonna be absorbing the bumps properly. You may as well have a hardtail. Get your sag sorted out and use that suspension travel, okay? You wanna be bottoming out your suspension every ride. I know that I bottom my ring out a couple of times every ride the o-ring on my shock that is if you're not using that travel the bike is not handling like it should do now this one has a fox shock they recommend 15 to 20 percent sag as your travel setup i run 20 percent because i want to use it the whole time honestly get your suspension set up we've got loads of videos on setting up your suspension in fact there's going to be one underneath this one watch it get your suspension set up and enjoy it it's brilliant okay now up to the front suspension fork on your bike now there's a few things you can do to eke out a bit more performance on your particular cross-country bike. One of them, if you've got an air fork, is by using volume spacers in there. Now it can feel quite intimidating when you have your suspension set up for the correct weight if you're just using that travel the whole time. Sometimes you might want to run some air volume spacers which make your fork feel a bit more progressive. It makes a huge difference to how your bike handles when you're clunking through stuff, especially downhill. Honestly, it makes a massive difference but also the wheel travel that you have on your bike. Now, you will be limited depending on what fork you have. This bike actually came with a Fox 32 and the maximum travel was 100 millimeters. I've actually swapped it out for a 34, which yeah, it's slightly heavier, but it allows me to run it at 110 mil travel. A teeny amount, but it makes actually quite a big difference to me. It's also a little bit stiffer and it has more importantly, more tire clearance. Now the wheels themselves that you choose on your cross-country bike make a significant difference, okay? Uh, so you've got carbon and alloy options out there and then you've got the size of the rims. Now, if you're a heavy rider, you need stronger wheels. The only way to really get stronger wheels light enough but remain stiff enough, unfortunately for you, may well be carbon like I'm using here. Now these got 28 spokes on them, but they've also got 28 millimeter rims. So they're nice and wide. In fact, you can even get up to 30 mil rims for cross country now. If you're a bigger rider, it's definitely worth considering because the volume it helps you get on your tires. Again, more air volume, lower the pressure. You've got a better footprint on the ground for more stability. All of these things add up. Now, alloy wheels, it's possible to get the same weight, but they're not often quite as stiff. So that's probably one of the only places on the bike where you get a significant advantage with carbon fiber cross-country wheels, light and stiff. That's what you want for tracking and performance. Now there's a couple other things as well with tire setup. Tire pressure makes an immense difference. I still see people running tires way too firm for off-road juice. Take a little digital tire gauge with you and experiment with your tire pressure. If you're struggling, uh, as in like uh, you're getting punctures or you're not getting it where you want, there's a few things you want to consider. One of them is by running tubeless. I run tubeless on everything. There's no way I would consider running inner tubes in this day and age. And I'm also now running an insert on my rear wheel. I don't choose to run one on the front. I've not needed to yet. But running one on the rear enables me to lower the pressure. I'm not going to damage the rim. Hopefully not going to split the tire. And it also means if I was to do a race, I've got to get me home there. So the whole point with these sort of inserts is if you do slash the tire, you can get back to the feed zone. So all things to consider if you're either a racer or a rider looking for more performance from your tires. Again, it's a contact point with the ground when you're on the bike. So it gives you a better feeling, gives you more confidence. All of these things combined together, I promise you, make a significant difference when you're descending. Well, that's how I set up my cross country bike. And as you can see, I love riding the thing. It feels great and it still is a lightweight cross country bike. Uh, hopefully there's some tips in there that help you feel a bit more confident out on the trails. Uh, if you want to ask anything about this bike or the way I ride it, let us know in those comments. And if you've got any ideas, fire away as well. See you in the next video.